part and then uh, calling for uh, his folks to stand down, uh, but never disbanding sure, the, the, the military and the movement itself. The government right now is riding high, feeling as, and the U.S. is feeling, that we've, mm. we've put this aside. Uh, his rivals are now mm. controlling Sutter City. They're going in mm. uh, to the, the city and in, mm. in the uniforms of the Iraqi army, but actually these are his rival his rivals with sure. the legitimacy of government. Has he been, I, I know mm. we've asked in, in different ways before, but has he been defeated? Uh, are they right to feel him defeated? Do they now have control on the ground of the military situation uh, or, or not? No, I don't think so. I mean, I was, uh, you know, you can move in and the militias go home. Um, and it sort of looks good for a bit. I mean, you know, they moved troops into Basra, Baghdad, Mosul in the last few months. I was in Mosul on the day they came in. There was a total curfew of uh, um, no vehicles, no people on the streets. You know, it looked as though the army had got complete control. Uh, but they arrest a lot of people. But I doubt if it means an awful lot, you know, because... Uh, the gunmen are still there. Um, I think they could uh, come out any moment. Uh, the government is sort of probably exaggerating its own uh, success at the moment. The U.S. played a very significant role in these victories. Sure, yeah. When, I mean, I think that's the reason you didn't fight. When they were, the, uh, in fact, the Iraqi army was defeated in uh, Basra, Basra and yeah. uh, al-Sadr city in Baghdad. And then the U.S. came and supported them with helicopters, with artillery, with advice. Um, and uh, then they, the Americans made uh, military progress, but it wasn't really the Iraqi army that did that. And as I said, Muqtada has never wanted a direct confrontation with the U.S. because he knows that his guys would lose. I have two questions that I want to want to focus yeah. on to learn a little more about him. One is that uh, he's made these multiple forays, yeah. uh, uh, some to expand control, some to mm -hmm. display resistance. Um, encounters a force more mm. overwhelming than he usually backed by the Americans and then he backs down uh, pulls back and um, uh, retreats for a time only to resurface again now, y you call it tactical in mm. in the book and and say that it's the sign of a, of a, a sort of an organizing mind that knows when to f move mm. forward when to come back some could also say that it's it's the the luxury afforded a charismatic leader who can make mistake after mistake after mistake but gets excused for those mistakes because he has this power of charisma. I remember, for example, being in Beirut in 1971 and the signs on the street were saying, Nasser says no to Rogers, meaning mm -hmm. the Rogers peace plan. Now, Nasser mm -hmm. had died, mm -hmm. but actually Nasser had said yes to Rogers. But the charismatic leader is, is always excused, is always forgiven mm -hmm. his, his flaws and seen as somehow yeah, no, having been idea. wily. Uh, is he wily or is he a blunderer who no, gets I excused think, for it because of his... I think he's uh, wily, actually. Yeah? I mean, this is somebody of great political experience. Secondly, you know, as I was saying, the number of dumb Iraqi political leaders is real small. If you're dumb, you're probably yeah. dead. Uh, so I don't think he's dumb. I think that and from quite an early stage, uh, he always ke has kept an exit. He's never liked to get sort of boxed into a, uh, by his opponents. His father did that, and his father-in-law did that, too. They, they were pretty clever at that at times. Yeah, they were clever. I mean, his <coughs> father, for a time, you know, um, Saddam thought he could use him mm -hmm. against the Iranians, um, and then began to notice that at uh, a Friday prayers, Muqtada's father would denounce everybody uh, who Saddam didn't like and would praise Islam, but somehow he never praised Saddam. This was a time when every newspaper in Bag Baghdad every day had Saddam's photograph. And of course mm -hmm. that shouted out to Iraqis what uh, Muqtada's father really thought about Saddam. And so he was the most, certainly the most dangerous opponent that uh, Saddam ever faced between, uh, I think, probably in the whole of his rule. But he does get away with a bit because he is charismatic. I mean, there sure, is this yeah. sense that Mm. Uh, people will follow him in spite of sure, the fact yeah. they keep losing. Yeah, you'll have a number of people who will uh, follow you, and, and that, that's key to his power because um, you have a very great big Iraqi army at the moment, but 
uh, who will the soldiers fight for? Mm -hmm. Do they really consider the government legitimate? Another question that keeps coming up is, again, it's, it's related to the question of Iran and Shiism. Um, he has fought many brutal battles against Sunni forces in, in the country, and his people have engaged in acts of terror against mm. civilians uh, who are Sunni, mm. especially during the period of, uh, of, of the, the, the real civil conflict that created a lot of ethnic cleansing in neighborhoods. At the same time, he is one of the few Shia who talks about um, a united Iraq and, and, and speaks like an Arab nationalist. Now, the question in many people's minds is, is he an Arab nationalist who wants the unity of Iraq? Is he a Shia sectarian who wants Shia control over Iraq? Is he a pawn of Iran, or is he an opponent of Iran? Sort those those issues out for us, or is it all of the above? It's uh, to a degree, it's all. I mean, leave aside the pawn of Iran. I don't think so. Yeah. He, you know, it's the when he's uh, uh, got bad relations with the Iraqi government and the U.S. He needs the Iranians. Was it's the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Uh, the Iranians. Uh, are uh, suspicious of him. Uh, recently, somebody went to see Muqtada, told me they were sort of in Khum, the um, Iranian holy city. He said the Iranians seem to be building a police uh, checkpoint outside his house to visit, to uh, vet his visitors. Um, but I think that Iraqi nationalist, yes. Uh, leader of the Shia, yes. But one of the problems about Iraq is that you could, you know, I keep having Sunni friends, Shia friends, who say to me, um, oh, you know, you exaggerate sectarianism in Iraq. You know, if they're a, a Sunni, they say, um, oh, my sister's married to a Shia, and, uh, um, um, and you know, they, uh, the, all these uh, leaders don't mean anything. And I say, well, what about Muqtada? What about Sistani? What about uh, Sharistani, the oil minister? What about many others? Oh, they're all uh, Iranian spies, you know, they're not representative. So you often have Iraqi nationalists, but they turn out to be basically Sunni nationalists or Shia nationalists. So, uh, and that's one of the reasons it's so difficult to bring peace. Now, Muqtada has said, you know, that he uh, he's a, uh, a Shia by religion and he's a Sunni by politics, but he must prove this on the ground. All the Iraqis must prove that this is going to remain a proper country of actually do things. It's very easy to be verbally non-sectarian, but Baghdad's completely divided at the moment. You know, there are walled enclaves. It's mostly Shia now, 75% Shia, I'd say. But the, the Sunni enclaves walled off, uh, walled off uh, uh, Shia enclaves. Um, people at mixed areas have largely disappeared. Uh, can people go back to their houses? They lost them. I've got a Sunni driver who lost his house in one uh, area. It's his only possession. Uh, can he go back? No, because he's been taken over by a Shia family. Um, the, uh, of course, there are fantasies. Somebody said, you know, he was a senior officer in the Mukhabarat. This mm -hmm. is a simple driver. Uh, I said to him, you know, maybe I know some people, maybe I could try and get your house back. He said, don't even try, because if they think I'm trying to get the house back, they'll come and kill me. You know, at the moment, we have, you know, in the United States, people saying things are getting better in Iraq. But I always think the best barometer is the two million or more Iraqis who fled to Syria and Jordan, often in terrible condition, desperate to go home. But they feel it's too dangerous to do so. That's the real way of judging what's happening mm -hmm. in Iraq is do people dare go back to their houses? Or are they living in some miserable refugee 